Okay, so um, hopefully, you know, I provide some of the information you guys were looking for, but please don't hesitate to ask questions. I sort of did my best to, to learn about the data you guys have been collecting and share some of that back um, at, towards the end. Um, but I'll be just talking more broadly about bats um, and monitoring efforts in California, as well as some of the results um, from these national scale surveys that have been scaled down um, to the state and to the park. Okay, so today I'm gonna to talk about sort of an introduction to bats for those of you that are familiar with this amazing group, um, some of the threats to bats and why there's this need to um, get some wide scale baseline monitoring of the status of our bat populations. I'm gonna tell you about a very large collaborative um, continental scale program called the North American Bat Monitoring Program. Um, the Pacific Best, sorry, the Pacific West Bat Hub, which um, you all are a part of by simply by being here on this meeting and, and sort of participating um, at your park as docents um, and give you some of those results I mentioned. Um, so bats, why, why, why study bats? Um, well, bats are a very large and diverse group of mammals that I'll get to in a minute, but we know very, very little about them. Um, the, um, this graph right here is showing us of bats. Um, we do know that a small, uh, sort of a substantial portion um, of bat populations are decreasing. Um, There's some that are found to be stable, but for over 50% of bat species, and we have over 1400 bat species, um, we really just don't know what the status of their populations are. They can be very difficult to study and know where they're living. Um, and how to monitor them. Um, 180 species are considered threatened um, by the U International Union for Conservation of Nature. This is the red list. And 227 are considered data deficient. Um, and another exciting thing about bats is that we're constantly still finding out information about their diversity. And just in the last two years or so, you might have seen in the news that um, a couple of new bat species have been discovered as well as rediscovered, ones that hadn't been observed um, for many, many decades, um, mostly in Africa. So this was an article in the New York Times um, describing one of those big discoveries of a new species. This is called Myotis nimbaensis, because it's from the Nimba Valley. Um, of the mammal orders of the world, bats are the second most species group. Um, 20 to 25% of all mammal species are bats. Um, they're on all continents except Antarctica. Um, phylogenetically or evolutionarily, they're more closely related to chimpanzees than rodents. So you might have heard myths that people call them flying rodents. They're really not. They're really different. Um, they just happen to be small mammals. Um, and we have a lot to learn from bats. They were super successful. They've been able to, um, to, to establish themselves in niches that no other animals have been able to do. So it's really um, a neat group to, to study and, and learn about. Um, one of the cool things about being in the Western United States is the biodiversity of bats is really high. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I work in the Southwest in Arizona and New Mexico, which is very high, but um, California as well has many, many species of bats and we don't know a lot about their ranges or have long-term data. And so it's just a really um, great place to be trying to figure out what's going on with our bat species and our bat populations. Um, as you may know, um, bats are very economically important. Um, uh, in agriculture due to how many um, pests they control. So a lot of our, um, our crops that are eaten by insects are, um, we're, we're actually it's been estimated that US farmers are saving $23 billion annually in pesticides and reduced crop damage due to bats. Um, some other cool benefits of bats, we do have three nectar feeding bats that are pollinators um, in the southwestern US and down into to the tropics. Um, and so 
They are very important for a lot of our tropical fruit um, pollination and fruit dispersal. They also are responsible for pollinating agaves and, and related species that give us tequila and mezcal and all of our favorite drinks. Um, so how many bats do we have? We said we have 1,400, over 1,400 um, in, in the world. Well, in the United States, we have 47 resonant species. Um, most of these are insectivorous, meaning they eat insects. We do have three nectivorous species that are sort of in that southwestern region I mentioned. They, they visit saguaro flowers and um, agave flowers and, and a few other cactus, columnar cactus species. Um, and there's been documented widespread population declines in our bat species in um, North America and particularly in the United States. Oops. How about California? Well, California has 25 of those 47 bat species that are in the, um, in the United States, mostly insectivorous. We do get one of our insect nectivorous species in California. Um, and as I mentioned before, the population status of many species is unknown. A lot of the bats that live in um, colder regions have been um, studied for much longer. They tend to congregate in much larger colonies um, and, and sort of are that typical cave dwelling species, but we have a lot more diversity in the types of habitats that our bats in California and the West occupy, um, and they often live in smaller groups. And so there's just um, a lot left to be known about what bats are found where. Um, here's some example of some of our great bats that can be found in California. Um, the one on the left is a spotted bat and these all have sort of different strategies or adaptations um, related to their echolocation strategies. So the spotted bat, bat, this one on the left actually has audible calls. Um, the Townsend big eared bat in the middle uses its, um, its, its um, what is it? I'm sorry. It actually, it, it echolocates through their mouth and receives it through their ears. Whereas on the right, this is a California leaf nose bat. It um, lives in Southern California, and this leaf nose bat um, echolocates actually through its nose, and so it has this really complex structure. And so bats have um, have a lot of really neat adaptations on their faces and their ears to occupy different sort of ways to use echolocation um, to to live and survive. Oh, here's a close up of that leaf nose bat. You can see it's got this cute little little pokey thing on the end of its nose. Um, let's see. Um, so this is a really cool bat. This is a gleaning bat. This is the pallid bat. Um, this is shown here eating a scorpion, um, but this bat has also been observed drinking cactus nectar when it's available. Um, and so this is just kind of a neat bat that gleans insects off the ground. Um, and it really, it eats a lot of centipedes and scorpions. So it's a very cool one. All right, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, some of the threats to bats in our area. Um, one of the biggest things that you may or may not have heard of is um, white nose syndrome. This is actually a disease caused by a fungus. Um, and it's been slowly um, spreading, sorry, not slowly, it's been rapidly spreading throughout um, the United States since it was first discovered in 2006 in um, one colony of bats in New York. This is, um, comes from, from um, Southeast Asia, I believe, the fungus, and it's had huge impacts to many of our bat species. We have three bat species where um, up to 90% declines of their entire population um, have occurred just in the last decade due to white nose syndrome. And this primarily affects bats that um, hibernate in cold places because the fungus causes them to um, wake up when it's still cold out and there's not a lot of food available. You can sort of see it right there why it's called white nose syndrome. 
Um, here's some more pictures of bats that are hibernating. Um, the name of the, um, the fungus is called pseudo gymnoascus destructans because it's very destructible. <laughs> um, and there's um, thought that it might have an impact on little brown bats, which are in California. That's Myotis lucivagus. Another really um, substantial threat to bats is wind energy development. Um, so it's been fairly well documented that um, bats are dying in large numbers, um, especially migratory bats. Um, more than three quarters of the bat fatalities that are happening at wind turbines are from species known as tree bats. Um, and these are ones that tend to migrate long distances and roots and trees. Um, and so these bats tend to migrate and mate primarily during the late summer and early autumn, um, which is also when the vast majority of bat fatalities at wind turbines occurs. Um, and so there's a lot of research right now going into um, seeing if there are deterrents or um, that can be placed on wind turbines to um, cause bats to avoid them, or if there's other strategies for changing um, the way that the wind turbines are working to reduce bat fatalities. Um, this is just a picture of um, the hoary bat, Lazarus cenarius. This is a bat that's really um, heavily impacted in particular by wind turbines. Um, let's see, and that's a red bat. These are also really impacted by wind turbines. Um, another major threat to bat populations that you all have probably thought about um, in regards to other species at your park is, um, is the impacts of drought and a changing climate. And so um, there's a lot of evidence that bats might be impacted by decreasing water sources, especially in um, arid and semi-arid areas. Um, and so this is sort of just a slide showing um, that there's a prediction that there's going to be large scale rain shifts and reduction in sort of refuges um, for bat communities in sort of drought risk areas. And so there's a lot of concern that um, the ranges of bats are going to be shrinking as, as drought and higher temperatures um, it becomes more frequent. Um, this is the, the Western Mastiff bat, um, and this bat is very thought to be very sensitive to drought. Um, it really is um, limited by having available drinking water, and it has these long, narrow wings that preclude it from drinking at ponds that are less than 100 feet long, so it needs like large water sources. Um, and so apparently due in large part to the loss of large natural springs, these bats are no longer found in any of the places that they previously occupied and are thought to potentially be endangered, um, but there's not enough data yet to, to show sort of what the direction of their populations are going in. And so, you know, we can't really know their status until we get more information. Um, just more broadly, habitat alteration and fragmentation is causing um, a lot of problems for some of our bats. Um, the silver hair bats, these are, these are really neat. These are in our mountain areas. I'm sure they're at your park. Um, they form maternity colonies almost exclusively in tree cavities or small hollows. Um, and like many forest roosting bats, these um, bats switch roosts throughout the maternity season. And because they're dependent upon roosts in old growth areas, um, managing forests for diverse age structure and maintaining forested corridors are thought to be really important for sustaining these bats. Um, and big brown bats, which are these ones right here, um, these ones traditionally also form maternity colonies, but beneath loose bark and in small cavities of pine, oak, beech, and cypress trees. Um, and so these also um, are thought to be really impacted by changes in habitat availability. All right. 
So now I'm going to talk to you a bit about the North American Bat Monitoring Program, which is something that your park is participating in. Um, so this is a multi-agency, um, so including federal agencies, state agencies, um, conservation organizations, um, citizen scientists, many, many people are participating in this program. Um, it's multinational, so we have it being carried out in Canada and Mexico, as well as the United States. And it's, thought, it's meant to be a long-term monitoring program to assess status and trends of North American bats. So as I sort of mentioned, we don't have super great data on all of those 47 species. Um, and so this program was established, um, I think about 10 years ago to improve the state of bat conservation through um, implementing standardized protocols. So everyone uses the same protocol so the data can be compared and big analysis can be done. Having a unified sampling design and being able to integrate data analysis over large areas. Um, Cause when people are just doing their own projects sort of in small areas and not the data is not necessarily available to everyone, it's harder to look at the broad scale trends of what's happening to that population. And the program, um, has a goal to provide regular analyses and reporting that can help um, inform managers and policy makers on effectively um, prioritizing bat conservation efforts. Um, and so this program is not just one thing, it's um, many things. <laughs> it's um, a resource that has created protocols and guidance for how to monitor bats. It's a database, so anyone collecting any kind of information on bat monitoring can contribute. Um, it's not just sort of capturing bats, it's re acoustic recordings of bats, it's counting bats in caves, it's tagging bats, um, it's many things. Um, there's this unified sampling design that I'll talk about in a minute. And it's sort of got a great, I'm gonna see if I can move my um, network of sites and communities of practice across um, the continent where people can work together to sort of build upon what's what's happening. Um, so um, what any bat does is it divides the continental US into a series of 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer grid cells um, and then assigns sort of it's it's kind of complicated. It's a spatially balanced randomized ordering of to each cell within the framework. And the point of that is to reduce bias so people aren't just monitoring um, places where they know bats are going to be, but um, tries to encourage getting data from many different types of habitats so that the um, range models that are that come out of this are, are meaningful and accurate. Um, this photo shows all the NA bat cells that are sort of just covering um, central California, but so you can sort of just see what it looks like. Um, and these cells can be selected for monitoring following um, priority ranking, which ensures sort of to reduce that bias, but also we encourage people to monitor at the sites where they're working so that the data that emerges is useful for this national program, but more importantly, it's something um, that is useful for you. Um, and some really great data has already been able to be useful from this program. Um, and these are data that were used to look at the severity and scope of white nose syndrome on hibernating bats in North America. And so there was only enough data um, for this analysis in particular, I think on five species, and they were all, as you can see here, um, eastern, sort of from the eastern U.S. or even the northeastern part of the U.S. because this is where there was a lot more long-term data and sort of highlights the importance of why we really, really need data um, from understudied areas, especially these um, super diverse parts of the continent. Um, and what this, what this study showed was indeed that, you know, these species numbers were dropping um, very rapidly due to the onset of um, white nose being introduced to different areas. So um, these are some of the data streams that are collected by NABAT. Um, what 
is happening, I believe at your park, are stationary acoustic surveys. And I'll talk a bit more about that, but it's where you put out detectors and the detectors record fats. Um, and then we can do data analyses of pro and processing those um, acoustic analyses to identify what species of bats are in a given area. It's just an amazing tool to do um, non-invasive passive monitoring and get a ton of information. There's also mobile acoustic transects where people drive through a transect, um, slowly collecting acoustic data on bats, um, colony counts, where you are assessing how many bats are in a cave or a, a colony, um, doing emergence counts, going to a cave and counting how many bats are coming out at, in the evening and coming back um, when they're done foraging, as well as capture data. Um, but sort of both Nat and I specialize in helping people get started on these passive ways of doing acoustic monitoring with that. Um, and just it's become much more accessible to get out there and collect some really great useful data. These are called song meter mini bats or these detectors about this big, um, you know, about the size of your hand and they can be deployed for long periods of time. Um, the protocol for any bat monitoring is actually four consecutive nights in the spring season um, before before, after migration, bird, uh, sorry, bats have migrated into an area and before the young start flying, um, but they just get put up on a pole. There's software that runs um, and it collects data and these ultrasonic frequencies that bats are using to communicate. Um, as I mentioned, whoops, um, within those 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer cells, we encourage people to collect data that um, is done, collected for four consecutive nights, post-migration, um, before those young are flying. And a really important part of this is that these cells get revisited annually. So we get that long-term record. So we don't just know who's present in one year, but actually um, what, the, what the trends look like. And you know, we can know if a wet year or a dry year or a hot year um, has any influence on the diversity that we're, we're finding. Um, so, um, one challenge is that it's often not necessarily easy to identify the species of bat based on the echolocation call. Um, and some species make dramatic adjustments in their calls depending on the complexity of their surroundings. And so we try to um, put out our detectors in a way that this reduces that, but um, bats that are in really what, what are called considered cluttered environments um, might be harder to detect than bats that are in wide open areas. And so um, like the size of the bat and the habitat they're in is all gonna influence our ability to detect them. And so that's one of the reasons why we try to get a variety of habitat types for multiple nights. Um, here's sort of an illustration of the types of calls that bats make. And on the bottom, you get sort of time on the um, on the x axis, and that shows you kind of the shape of their echolocation call with the frequency on the y axis. Bats will call anywhere between 10 to, I think, like 100 kilohertz. Um, and so when they're in a search phase, they make a certain kind of call, and those are the easiest to use to identify what species they are. Um, as they're approaching a prey, like they identified a moth that they're going to go after, their calls become um, more closer together and less defined. And then when they have these buzz phases or feeding buzzes that we call them, then when they're sort of sweeping in there to get their, their um, moth, they're a little bit harder to identify. So we're actually working with the national program to see if we can identify some of those feeding buzzes and how they look different for different species. Because right now we know more about what the search phase looks like for different species. Um, here's another example of what a bat echolocation sonogram looks like. We have the frequency here, um, time on, on the x-axis, and 
and you can get a sense of what these shapes look like. You can get harmonics um, and echoes pick, getting picked up. Here's what those feeding buzzes look like as they get closer and closer to a, to a prey that they're gonna eat. But the shape of these um, echolocation calls, here it looks kind of like a hockey puck, look really different for different species, which is what's really neat. Um, some of them will echolocate closer to the 20 range, whereas others might be at the 40 and above. Um, and just sort of where, the, where they put the power in those calls looks different too. Um, and so on the NABAT website, we can actually um, go in and look at um, regional bat summer occupancy status and trend information. Um, and I haven't had a chance to dig super deep into the data on the NABAT website yet, but they are published their um, their, their um, status and trends for sort of their first set of analyses that go through 2019. And we can use that acoustic data to see how occupancy um, and diversity has been changing over the years of the analyses. Um, and so there's a website I can put into the chat when I'm done with this, um, that's called nabatmonitoring.org and sort of a dynamic data dashboard where you can explore different regions and different species and see what kind of data exists for, um, for understanding both um, the population trends as well as occupancy trends. And by occupancy, I mean um, which bats are found where and sort of what their ranges are. Um, so one of the species that was included in that occupancy model, I think this was the only species that was, has, had had enough data to be included was Yuma myotis um, for their summer occupancy modeling. And these are the 2019 cells in California that were used as part of that analysis. And so these data are actually enormously useful for um, being used in federal decision-making about understanding which species are vulnerable um, and should be considered, um, considered for being listed in the future. Um, so when we started the um, NABAT hubs that Nat from the Pacific West and myself in the Southwest started, we both started early in 2020 um, and we're able to just by coordinating and providing assistance um, through our program to really increase the amount of monitoring happening in these regions. And so I just think it's um, a real testament to what you all are doing and what is happening throughout the region. We've really heavily increased how much um, data is being collected and sort of the range, the geographic range of data being collected. So. I anticipate in the next couple of years, we're gonna see more and more of our Western species being included in these continental scale analyses and understanding more what's happening to their populations. So this is from um, 2021. My understanding is that you all have been monitoring since um, 2020 from what I saw in the report. Okay, so a little bit about this PacWest hub that I've mentioned in case it's sort of new to you or this is the first you've heard about it. Um, these NABAT hubs um, are covering a good chunk of the US and Canada now. And the point of it really is to drum up um, participation across the continent um, by providing more on the ground support. We also have a lot of services um, by, you know, if you know folks in other areas that might be interested in uh, monitoring we loan out detectors and we also have a national data processing lab where we process data, um, upload it and provide report outs. And this has really um, helped increase sort of our ability to, to understand which bat species are found where. Um, and so the goals of the Pacific West hub where you all are located is to increase bat monitoring efforts in California and Nevada lower barriers to participation in data collection. And so that's, like I said, we have um, 
detectors to loan out, but we also do a lot of trainings um, and deliver regional products that inform conservation. Um, and so I took a look at the report that Nat had created um, for your cell, or sorry, for your park. Um, and so I, I'm sure that this can be made available to all of you, but it's sort of an interactive HTML report where you can explore where the sites are, where data is being collected. And so here's your map of survey location. Dylan can chime in if this looks correct or not. Um, but it looks like you have four stations that are being monitored annually, which is really great. Um, and here's a list of the species that were detected at the four different sites in this NABAT cell, number 3562. So next indicates the species was detected. And so um, this is a really high diversity of bats. Um, and so we can um, I can show you pictures of any of these bats. I have a pulled up on, on another screen right now. So we can go through that if there's time. Um, but you've got Townsend's beard eared bats, big brown bats, western red bats, furry bats, silver male haired bats, um, four different species of myotis. We've got our Mexican or Brazilian three tailed bats, pallid bats, those cool bats that eat the scorpions off the ground, and uh, long legged myotis as well at one of the sites. Um, and then here's sort of an idea. One thing that's really valuable when you have multiple years of data is to be able to compare years and see, hey, what's different or similar about the years. And so we can get a little bit more information by looking and seeing, um, hey, it looks like maybe in 2021, um, there was the most species detected at Quail Hollow, but in um, at the Southwest Campus Reserve, um, there was fewer species detected in the year before. So those are some of the fun things we can do. Um, I can just switch right over and show you some of those pictures from your, from your um, surveys. Here's that pallid bat, Townsend's big-eared bat, so cute. Our big brown bats, western red bats, love these guys. Um, hoary bats, those are the ones that are being really impacted by wind. Silver bats, these are the ones that are um, living in the old growth forests. California myotis, long-eared myotis drinking from a stream. Fringed myotis, these ones have these great, great toes. <laughs> um, Long-legged myotis, Yuma myotis, and the um, Brazilian free-tailed bats. These are the guys that live in really large colonies, often under bridges, and migrate up from Mexico every spring. Um, we can also look here and see what the setups look like in the different um, in the different sites. So we've got sort of a nice diversity of habitats as well at your sites being um, being monitored from sort of edge habitats and, and forested habitats. Um, all right. I'm excited to look in the chat. Looks like there's a lot of comments in there. <laughs> Um, and I definitely kept it a little shorter than I think the time I was allotted. So I apologize for that, but hopefully it gives us more time for questions. Um, as I mentioned, I am not the coordinator for the Pacific West Hub, but I am stepping in to help out. So I'm always available to any of you for any questions you have about bats, or if you wanna expand monitoring in your region or at your park, um, you can learn more about sort of the services and available from the PacWest Hub at www.pacwestbats.org. You can also learn more about um, the NA Bat program at nabatmonitoring.org. And I just, I know you're all docents and I wanna sort of give a shout out for um, checking out Bat Conservation International's website or batcon.org. So this sort of end part of here, I can also put that in the chat. There's some really great resources, um, education resources and printoutables of bat masks for coloring and bat pollination booklets um, and sort of different educational activities for different age groups that I use all the time in, in schools and doing outreach activities. So totally recommend you checking it out. And if you have a hard time finding them, just shoot me an email. Um, and I think that was 
all I had for my presentation. And I definitely apologize for going a little fast if I did. <laughs>